As of 1939, these were the British colonies in Africa, French, Belgium, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. This guy didn't have any colonies in Africa because during the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, Germany had been forced to cede its colonies to the Allied powers after losing World War I. So in 1939, Uncle Adolf said to the rest of Europe, If I can't own a piece of Africa, you can't have it too. Mmm, I lied. Hitler did not say this. But what he did between 1939 and 1945 is one of the reasons why, starting from 1946, European powers had no choice but to start leaving Africa, which is why an African poet, Professor Tabanlo Leong said, Africans have three white men to thank for their political freedom and independence, Marx, Nietzsche, and Hitler. I won't talk about Marx and Nietzsche in this video. I will also not glorify Hitler or present him as the messiah of the African people. Instead, we will answer the question, what did Hitler do to help Africa gain independence from the European powers? Why did European powers suddenly start abandoning their precious African colonies after World War II? And lastly, if Hitler didn't exist, could it be that Africa would still be colonized today? In his 1990 Kwame Nkrumah's biography, professor of modern history David Birmingham wrote, West Africa's erstwhile model colony witnessed a riot and business premises were looted. The African Revolution had begun. This quote is in reference to the beginning of the end of the British Empire in Africa, and this is the background story. In August 1947, just 23 months after World War II, the United Gold Coast Convention UGCC, was founded in what's today Ghana. This group was founded by J.B. Danka, R.A. Awuno Williams, George Alfred Grant, and a few others who later invited a 38-year-old Kwame Nkrumah because he was stubborn, razored mouth, and had a hot temper needed to punch the queen in the face. <laughs> son of a goldsmith, Nkrumah had studied theology, philosophy and economics at Lincoln University, Pennsylvania between 1935 and 1939. He also earned a Bachelor of Science degree in economics at the London School of Economics in 1942, the most charismatic human being you will ever meet. When he eventually made it to become the General Secretary of the UGCC, Nkrumah inspired the organization to force Britain out of Ghana. They play upon our vanities and flatter us in every kind of way. It's at this point you start seeing how this artist was instrumental in Africa's independence. You see, this guy and other leaders of UGCC organized protests, strikes, boycotts and recruited 63,000 ex-servicemen. What did they need ex-servicemen for? Well, UGCC was preparing for guerrilla warfare against the British colonial power. Nkrumah then went to the UK Prime Minister. Uh, no, no, not, not this one, not this one. This one has lost the 1945 election because he was too fat. <laughs> yes, this one. Kwame Nkrumah made it known to the British authority that he was ready for war and this time around, the British had to take him seriously for three reasons. Reason number one is Europeans had trained hundreds of thousands of Africans how to fight a war. This is not to say that Africans couldn't fight a war before the 1940s. Instead, it means now you have more people who have been trained and exposed to war during World War II be because starting from 1939 when Uncle Hitman started punching Poland in the face which marked the beginning of the World War II, the British and French had recruited hundreds of thousands of Africans for the war. Lieutenant Colonel George Gifford worked hard to recruit fighters for the British in these British colonies. They were called the Royal West African Frontier Force RWAFF. General Charles de Gaulle, who later died of a heart attack because, yeah, did the same for the French army here. Serving under General Sir Alan Cunningham and General Sir Bernard Montgomery, also known as Monty, 
in the period of six years, the British alone recruited as many as 300,000 men from this region. Now, let's go back to the 63,000 ex-servicemen I told you Kwame and Kuma recruited. Many of these fighters have been in World War II. They have fought in North Africa, the Middle East, Burma, and Europe. They were involved in combat operations and support roles and played crucial roles in logistics and infrastructure. They've been trained by the British and gained experience in the most brutal war the world has ever seen. And most importantly, they have seen that the white man is a human being just like them. I'll elaborate on these statements later in the video. For now, Let's focus on the fact that after World War II, many more Africans were prepared to take up arms against the European colonizers because hundreds of thousands of them had learned how to wage modern war, thanks to this human being. But is this enough to scare Great Britain? Could a few hundred thousand Africans with some solo shooter, single bang blaster rifles scare an empire with the largest and most formidable naval and air forces in the world? Mm, no. Not even for a second. The British Empire did not colonize one quarter of the world because they were afraid of war. They did it because their first name is War. Their second name, War. And last name, uh, I guess, Britons. But there's another element to this story which is the second reason why the British had to take this man and other African nationalists seriously. And that is, back at home in Britain, nobody, I mean, Nobody was ready for another war after World War II. In his 1948 book, The Cost of Empire, the British politician and former British Secretary of State for War, John Strachey, wrote, In the past, the British people have been willing to face death and heavy casualties to preserve their empire. But after two world wars in a single generation, it is very doubtful whether they would have the same resolution today. With the war expenditure of 21 billion pounds, estimated to be more than 1 trillion dollars in today's currency, which had put Britain in great debt, with several factories, power plants, communication networks, railway networks and industrial sites in cities like London, Coventry, Plymouth, Liverpool, Birmingham and many other cities turned to rebels, with housing shortages, food rationing, high levels of unemployment, Thousands of mothers and wives who have lost their sons and husbands in World War II started another war in an attempt to keep colonies in Africa was the last thing the British society wanted in 1947. Another reason why European powers didn't have an appetite to keep their colonies by force after World War II was that, well, by 1947, another war had begun. Since we people of the world are so peaceful, we need wars to be happy, so after World War II, we simply started another war. This time around, we didn't want it hot, so we called it the Cold War. With the Soviet Union vying for influence in Africa by providing assistance, which included weapons to the nationalist movements on the continent, the best Europe and America could do was to counter Soviet ambition with a smile instead of the weapon. This is the reason why, instead of going to Ghana with warplanes, this beautiful lady went there to go and hook. No, no, don't, ever, complete that statement. I mean, hook down with the Ghanaian first president, the same Nkrumah I've told you about. Look, look, look at her face. She was in love, wasn't she? Throughout this section, I use the story of Nkrumah and his country Ghana as an example of the African geopolitical situation after World War II. This however doesn't mean that Nkrumah was the king of Africa. Instead, the story of the country and the man is an example of what was going on in different countries of Africa after 1945. In his 1965 autobiography Sukano, the first president of Indonesia, Kosno Sosro Dihajo wrote, Universal ideas cannot be conquered by guns. You can occupy a country, but you cannot occupy the mind of a people with guns. Propaganda is the chief weapon in modern warfare. During World War I, the innocent word propaganda, which comes from the Latin word propagar, meaning to spread information, had been given a new meaning, now meaning anything your enemy says. During World War II, the Allies created tons of propaganda leaflets, news articles, speeches, and even movies to depict the war as a battle for justice, democracy, and freedom. Charles de Gaulle, 
Yes, the same fire-breathing dragon I told you about earlier had said on a radio broadcast on August 18, 1944, Stand firm, fight hard for your future, for your freedom, for your country. The light of liberty is still shining. The enemy shall not extinguish it. When their wiki, a U.S. lawyer and 1940 U.S. Republican presidential nominee had said, This war is a war for the liberation of humanity. It is a war to determine whether the world is to be ruled by force or by law. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, in his State of the Union address of 1941, said regarding the ongoing war, Freedom is indivisible. Therefore, each nation must be free to live as it desires. No nation must be dominated by another. The same president had given a speech on January 6, 1941, titled Four Freedoms, in which the word freedom reportedly appears 30 times in a 569-word speech. Then you may want to ask, how do all these have anything to do with Hitler and Africa's independence? Well, you have to remember this map that I showed you at the beginning of this video. With every single piece of land in Africa except Libya and Liberia under the control of European powers during World War II, when these same people started preaching and telling Africans that they had to go and fight Hitler for the freedom of humanity, it's like me coming to your house three days after I stole your car and then asking you to come and fight with me against somebody who wants to steal my bicycle. Hey, bros, I, I need your help, please. For what? Um to to recover my stolen bike but you stole my car didn't you mm, I'm, I'm sorry i guess okay bring the car key first even though there have always been nationalist movements criticism and armed resistance against the colonial administrations in africa the western hypocrisy during world war ii i mean the Europeans and Americans claim that everybody should be free, while at the same time, the entire continent is under the bondage of colonization, just got many more Africans to be enraged. If the war against Hitler was for freedom, why can't you give us the same freedom? Many Africans started asking this question. For this simple reason, if there were 10 nationalist movements in Africa in 1939, they became 200 by the end of World War II. If 10% of the population was angry against the European rulers in 1939, now 90% is angry. If 50,000 people were ready to take up arms against the European powers, now they were 30 million. On page 12 of his 1994 autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela wrote, These white men appeared as grand as gods to me. Earlier in the video, while talking about the 63,000 ex-servicemen that this guy gathered, I made this statement. They've been trained by the British and gained experience in the most brutal war the world has ever seen. And most importantly, they have seen that the white man is a human being just like themselves. I promise to explain this statement later, so let's do that quickly. Have a second look at what Nelson Mandela wrote in his autobiography. These white men appeared as grand as gods to me. Mandela wrote this in his book when giving an account of his earlier encounter with white people and how most people in his village treated a white man. You see, for more than 500 years, Africans, at least many Africans, have been made to believe that white people were not ordinary humans like themselves. This false belief had worked so well to make Africans adore, cherish and revere the white man and this was good for the domination of the African continent. However, during World War II, these false beliefs started fading away in the face of bullets and artillery fire. But the actual weapons and ammunition. With about 1 million African fighters fighting beside white men during World War II, many Africans saw for the first time how a white man cries, how white men get wounded, and how, just like themselves, a white man bleeds to death. This experience changed how some Africans saw the white man, at least for those who earlier believed the lie that the white man was not like themselves. When you think someone is just as mortal as you are, you now have a better chance at confronting them, right? In 1946, just one year after the World War II, France changed its Ministry of Colonies to the Ministry of Overseas France and started preparing to get the F out of Africa. The British, Spain, Italy, 
everybody was preparing to leave. It was only a matter of settling the book, taking the last possible loot and creating a political environment in Africa that would allow continuous and friendly relationships between the African and European empires. Starting from January 1st, 1956, countries in Africa started gaining independence and by the end of the 1960s, most of the African countries were self-governed. So far in this video, I've shown how Hitler starting World War II meant that the Allies recruited Africans to fight in the war. When the war was over, the continent had more people who could fight than they had in 1939. Another factor was that the terrible war had destroyed and weakened the British, France and the entire Europe, so nobody was willing to start another war to keep African colonies. The third factor was the Allies' propaganda and hypocrisy about freedom which made more Africans wonder why it was okay to fight for freedom on one hand and keep the continent colonized on another. This then increased the numbers of people who were ready to riot, protest or even take up arms. We can point to other factors like the Soviet Union, the Cold War, etc. and all of them would contribute in some ways to explain this complex topic. Now, let me say something very important. Even though Professor Taban Lo Leong said, Africans have three white men to thank for their political freedom and independence. Marx, Nietzsche and Hitler. I do not present Hitler as a messiah of Africa in this video. No, he was not. Hitler didn't sit down in his bunker and think, yeah, we're gonna free Africa, so let's start the war. Instead, Africa's independence came as an unintended consequence of a six-year brutal war that destroyed the European powers and it just happened to start it. Another fact we must not omit is that it was not all the territories Europe colonized in Africa they left without a fight. There were still riots, even wars of independence in countries such as Algeria, Kenya, Zimbabwe and Angola. But those wars would have been worse, more deadly and longer, if not because Europe by this time was a wounded dog. If I've missed anything in this story or misrepresented a fact or history, I'm sure the comment section will punish me. <laughs>